All right, a lot of masks are off today, so now we know whether or not you're singing. So I want you guys to bring it as we come to worship our Lord and Savior. Let our hearts be for Him. Let our mouths be for Him. Let everything we do praise and glorify His name. Amen? All right. We got some announcements for you today. I want to make sure my... Is this on? All right, cool. Um, well, first of all, if you're visiting with us today, take one of those cards, fill it out, drop it right in front of you, drop it into the collection plate later so we get to know you. Uh, a lot of us got together this past Friday evening and for the talent show, and it was a great time. Uh, so much talent here at Knox. People were sharing songs and skits and jokes, and uh, there's a, a thing with walkers that had to be seen to be believed. Uh, it was just a truly great time. So I want to say thank you to Sisters of Faith for hosting the talent show and everybody who participated. It was, it was a great time of fellowship and outreach uh, as well. A few more announcements. Uh, we have a new member class coming up February 29th. If you're thinking about joining the church or you want to find out more about what the membership process entails, what about what we believe, uh, the membership class is there as just a one-hour start to finish. Here's what we believe as a church, as a denomination, how you can join. It doesn't commit you to joining, but if you join, you have to go through the class at some point. Did I say 29th? 27th. Thank you. Uh, February 27th, so a couple uh, Sundays from now we'll, we'll have that. Uh, so join us for that. Uh, we have our teaching series that's been going on on Wednesday evenings. We're looking at the covenants of the Bible and how God builds his relationships to his people through covenants. It's a great series. I know the, the title, it's a hard sell for me to get you enthusiastic about covenants, uh, but it is actually really cool. It changes the way you see the overall Bible. And if you've missed the first or second one, we have it available on YouTube. You can watch those catch up. Come join us on Wednesday night at 7. We have a game night coming up this Friday. So, man, every Friday in February, we had the talent show last week, game night this week. Next week, we'll have uh, the, the movie. So come join us this Friday, 6.30. Bring a board game, bring a card game, or just come. Bring yourself. And we'll just have some fun hanging out, enjoying some refreshments and doing that. We also have an Ash Wednesday service on March 2nd. Easter is right around the bend, so we've got to start our time of Lent. So we'll have a service at 7 o'clock on Wednesday, March 7th, 2nd. So, um, oh, I got a little text reminder. Hey, don't forget to mention, we're also going to be starting our Baskets of Hope. Uh, that's something we started last year for Sheridan Parkside. Keep your eyes open for that. We're going to be asking people to donate items for the baskets and also needing some people to get together to assemble and deliver them. So that's an outreach that we'll be doing over the next month and a half. I think that's all the announcements we have for today. Center our hearts and mind for God. Good morning, everyone. Please rise for our call to worship. Let us shout aloud to the rock of our salvation. Let us come before him. Good morning. Please join us for our first song, Grace Like Rain. Oh, no. 
Please remain standing for the confession of sin. Create in us a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within us. Do not cast us from your presence or take your Holy Spirit from us. Restore us to the joy of your salvation. Take a moment and lay your sins at the cross. Our assurance of pardon is from Isaiah 53. He was wounded for our transgressions and crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the punishment that made us whole, and by his bruises we are healed. Amen? Amen. Please. Please have a seat. I'd like to invite the kids up to the front for the children's sermon. Look what was in... Hey, come down here. Come down here. Only really short people get to go up there. Come down here. Look what I found. You have to come down because I want to show you something I found in the Bible today. What's that? That looks like a really badly made Valentine's Day card, doesn't it? Yeah, it does. Are you guys excited about Valentine's Day? Yeah. It's kind of fun, right? Eh, yeah, it's like, well, what are some things we do for Valentine's Day? We love people, we give out cards, we celebrate, we eat lots of pink sugar. Yeah, it's, it's good. I like getting cards. You guys like getting cards? I love getting mail. Do you like? You're taller than me. That's cool. All right? You like getting cards, right? And cards tell us who loves us. So I'm curious about this card that I found in the Bible there. What it says, I bet it's from somebody who loves all of us. Benji, would you like to read this one here? Would you read that into the mic and tell us who that's from and what it says? This is how we know God loves us. While we were still sinners, Jesus died for us. Keep it close. Wow. This is how we know God. So come down here. Guys, come here. Sit right here. Sit. Sit. So this is from God. And God says, you know how much I loved you? While you were sinners, while you were doing bad things, while you were still angry with me, I loved you and I died for you. Jesus didn't die for us when we were perfect, Casey. He died for us when we weren't perfect to help make us better. So if that's how God loves us, nope, we're sitting down. Come here. Have a seat. Have a seat. If that's how God loves us, how do we love God back? Do you have any ideas how we can love God back? How? Cause, How do we love God back? Because cause we be nice. We could be nice, absolutely. How can we love God back? Because it's her, cause it is, cause we his children. We are his children. And how can we love him as his children? What do you think? Because we love him. Yeah. What are some things we can do to love God? Because all... With all his heart, we love him back. All right, so we can love him with our heart. You know what? The Bible not only tells us how God loves us, it tells us how. Nah, have a seat. It tells us how we can love God. I'm going to open this up. Awesome. Would you read this for us really loud, right in the mic? This is how we can love God. If you love, if you love me too, obey my commands. So Jesus said, if you love me, Obey my commandments. All my commands. Commands to love other people and commands to love God and to obey Him and to not lie. Hey, have a seat. All right? So we can, God loves us. He died for us. And we can love God by obeying Him. All right? So tomorrow, I want you to give Jesus a Valentine's Day card by doing at least one thing to obey His commandments, to obey the Bible. Okay? Can we pray? Because we're going to need a lot of prayer to help us do that. Wait, wait. All right, let's pray. Okay. Dear Jesus, thank you for today. We thank you for the Bible. We thank you that you loved us so much. You died for us. And we pray that we can love you too, God, by obeying your commands. In your name, amen. amen. All right, here's a, here's a Valentine's Day card you can take home with you. All right, go have a seat. Thank you. All right, grab your Bibles with me as we go to Exodus chapter 1. Let's open up to Exodus chapter 1. We'll be studying verses 8 through 21 
today. It's located at page 55 of your pew Bible. Let's rise and see what God wants to tell us today. Exodus 1, starting verse 8. Now there arose a new king over Egypt who did not know Joseph, and he said to his people, Behold, the people of Israel are too many and too mighty for us. Come, let us deal shrewdly with them, lest they multiply, and if war breaks out, they join our enemies and fight against us and escape from the land. Therefore they set taskmasters over them to afflict them with heavy burdens. They built for Pharaoh store cities, Pithom and Ramses. But the more they were oppressed, the more they multiplied, the more they spread abroad, and the Egyptians were in dread of the people of Israel. So they worked them ruthlessly and made the people of Israel work as slaves, made their lives bitter with hard service in mortar and brick and in all kinds of work in the field. And in all their work, they ruthlessly made them work as slaves. Then the king of Egypt said to the Hebrew midwives, one who was named Shifra and the other Pua, when you serve as midwife to the Hebrew women and see them on the birth stool, if it is a son, you shall kill him. But if it is a daughter, she shall live. But the midwives feared God and did not do as the king of Egypt commanded them, but let the male children live. So the king of Egypt called the midwives and said to them, Why have you done this? Why, and let the male children live. And the midwives said to Pharaoh, Because the Hebrew women are not like Egyptian women, for they are vigorous. They give birth before the midwives come to them. So God dealt well with the midwives, and the people multiplied and grew very strong. And because the midwives feared God, he gave them families. And God bless this reading as we start exploring Exodus today. Please have a seat. Who here remembers the Beanie Baby fad of the 1990s? Who here invested in Beanie Babies in the 1990s? All right. Thank you for your, your honesty. I can see the bitterness in your eyes. You know where I'm going with this. There's a period of time for, for deep preparation for this sermon today. I had to go back and watch some videos refreshing my memory on how insane we were as a country when it came to Beanie Babies. Uh, you know what these were. They were small little stuffed animals, little beads in them. But the genius of ba Beanie Babies is that the company that made them sold them in limited editions. And when you have a limited edition product and there's high demand for it, that limited edition product can increase in value. And so people went nuts for Beanie Babies. Not kids. Kids didn't get to play with the toys. It was the adults, right? It was the adults that would buy these toys because their value was, it was skyrocketing so much that one day, legitimately, you could buy a $5 Beanie Baby and the next day sell it for $5,000 on eBay. And this, this sort of thing was happening all over the place. People were like, oh my goodness, hearing all these stories of the value of Beanie Babies. And so they would buy all these and just figured they're going to retire on a Beanie Baby portfolio. There was even, and you can look this up because it is both the funniest and saddest thing you'll ever see in your life. It was divorce court, a picture of divorce court, when a guy and a girl, the husband and wife, as they're separating, were sitting on the floor of the courtroom, dividing up their pile of Beanie Babies. You might have seen this. Yeah, you know, that one's mine, that one's mine, and oh, you're like, There's, these are grown people doing this. But the reason we're not so crazy about Beanie Babies today is that somewhere around 1999, almost virtually overnight, the bubble burst. The value collapsed, the demand was no longer there, and pretty much every toy lost that inflated value. People had spent so much money for these Beanie Babies, expecting that they were going to go on forever, suddenly we're sitting on top of garage sale fodder. I mean, to this day, we can go to garage sales and buy Beanie Babies for quarters and give them to my kids, and finally it's going back to the kids where it should have gone in the first place. It was an epic fall from favor. It's an epic fall, but it's by no means the greatest. I'm sure we could point to individuals and companies. Blockbuster video, right? Huge rise to prominence in the 80s and 90s. Where is it today? Well, Netflix creamed it, right? The, 
didn't jump on board the streaming services fast enough. Fall from favors. Sometimes we like to go, you know, laugh a little, a little schadenfreude, going, well, that wasn't me, those fools. And we like a good story of somebody who fell. But when it comes to epic falls from favor, I don't know how greater you could get than what happens between Genesis chapter 50 and Exodus chapter 1. You go back and remember your history back in Genesis. Genesis 50, by then, God had raised up Joseph in that multi-chapter great story of how God raised him up into the second in power over all of Egypt, had immense power and prestige and wealth. He could say something, it would happen. God raised him up, and through that, he saved his family. Through that, his family was given, granted land by the Pharaoh in Egypt, some of the most lush, habitable land in all of the country said, you, you guys can go settle your family there. He rose to such prominence that when Joseph's father Jacob died, the Egyptian military gave him an escort, his body an escort, back to Canaan where they buried his body. That's how impressive uh, this rise to, to favor and rise to power was. And then we wonder, what happened? Because we turn to Exodus chapter 1, and it's like this crash, this beanie baby fall, almost virtually overnight. Of course, it wasn't overnight. It's a couple hundred years later. But still, for us, it's a shock to the system. Because we've gone from, from God's people, from the Hebrews being nearly at the top of the food chain in Egypt, going all the way down to the ground and maybe below, below. Well, a lot of changes have happened. As we talked last week, Dad Joseph and his uh, brothers and all their descendants started multiplying. That God had blessed them greatly. So they started having kids, and those kids started having kids, and they just started spreading all throughout the, the region of Egypt. But as this multiplication happens, as the Israelites start swelling in numbers, Satan takes the Cold War that we talked about and suddenly goes hot start ramping up attacks against God's chosen and brings them pain and suffering unlike anything they've ever known in their lives. That shouldn't be surprising, I don't think, to anybody who has followed God for any length of time because suffering is always in our future and always in our past when we follow Christ. 1 Peter 4.12 tells us, don't be shocked when times of trials come upon us when we suffer for the name of Christ. It's going to happen. And when that happens, Peter says, when we fall from favor in the world's eyes, when we kind of crash and burn, and everybody's pointing fingers, and everybody's saying, I'm glad I'm not those people, the Bible tells us, rejoice, because you will see how God now reveals His glory. How God takes a defeat and pulls a victory out of it. But how can we do that? How can we do that when we feel like our world is crumbling? We feel like we're so oppressed. We can do it by looking at the past. By looking at what the Bible tells us is this great epic fall from favor. We can look at Exodus 1 and see how Satan had a plan, but God's plan was over Satan's plan. And God's plan was ultimately triumphant. Well, verse 8, if you still have your Bibles open, you can take a look there. Verse 8, I think, is probably the most ominous in all of the book of Exodus because it signals a shift in tone. For the first seven verses, things are going pretty great. Kids, blessings, multiplication. And then it says, then a new king. Then a new king. To whom Joseph meant nothing came to power in Egypt. A new pharaoh comes into power, and he honestly could not care less about the legacy of Joseph and his descendants. He doesn't remember, he doesn't care what Joseph did back in the day to save the country from a multi-year famine. Remember, God not only worked through Joseph to save the people of God, but also to save the people of Egypt. That he blessed them. Without Joseph, without God working through Joseph, those people would have starved to death after a couple of years. But now this new king doesn't remember. And this new king, we can infer, is very insecure, as many new kings are. 
You just come to power. Once you come to power, you don't want to lose it. You want to secure your reign. And so you start looking for threats, both real and imaginary. And for whatever reason, this pharaoh zeroes in on a group of foreign visitors who have been settled into the land, now are multiplying, and you know, also they're occupying a really choice piece of real estate that he would like to have for his people. So this pharaoh then stirs up fear against them. That's his first move here, stirring up fear. He tells the Egyptian population, he says, we must deal shrewdly with them or else they'll defect, join our enemies, fight against us, leave the country. The way the Pharaoh starts his campaign against the Israelites is, as he says, very shrewd. It is a pattern that we have seen throughout all of human history, again and again, whenever there is a dictator, whenever there's somebody in power who wants to oppress and get rid of a people group. So to truly oppress a people group, you don't start slaughtering them on day one. Here's what you do if you ever become a dictator, and you know, I hope not. I don't want to be on the news. You know, did you really know that that person in your church was going to you know, grow up to do this? No. Um, but here's how you do it, okay? Here's the secret. First step, you isolate the people group by demonizing them and dehumanizing them. You make them into a threat that the rest of society turns against. You don't want anybody sticking up for them. You don't want anybody coming to their aid. So you got to make them the others. And of course, we're not just tribalistic in today's society. People are always in tribes. And always it's us and the others. And we're not to love the others unless, of course, you follow Jesus Christ in which he says, love your neighbors. Love the others. But that's not how dictators do it. They isolate. Then, step two, you strip them of their freedoms and you enslave them. You make them property of the state so that you have control over their movement, over their lives. And then finally, at that point, you can work to exterminate them. This is exactly the pattern that Hitler used in the lead up to World War II with the Holocaust. It's exactly the pattern that you've seen in genocides such as Cambodia, Rwanda, and Bosnia. Isolate, strip freedoms, exterminate. And this is the pattern we see in Exodus chapter 1. Right at the start of this book, we have a king who says, this is going to be my threat. This is my main mission right now, to get rid of this group. Reclaim that land, secure my rise to power. And in so doing, he is setting himself up to be the chief obstacle between God and his plan. God has a plan for his people. Remember, he's already told it to Jacob. I, don't be afraid to go to Egypt. I will bring you down there. I will forge you into a great people. I will bring you out. And Pharaoh says, no, you won't. I will kill them. I will keep them here. You don't get to call the shots. The Pharaoh is getting in the way between him and God. And this is honestly the most powerful person alive at the time. At the time in the ancient world, Egypt was the greatest country, and the Pharaoh was the greatest person in the greatest country. There was nobody above him in the food chain. He thought himself literally as a God king for people to worship him. The kings that would often of Egypt would often take names of the gods and they would fuse them onto their own names. That's how they saw themselves. Because really, who could say otherwise when he said, these people are evil and we must fear them? Well, when we look at our own lives, when we fear, I think a lot of Christians, we start looking around at things happening in our country. And some of us are very sensitive to that. And we go, oh, we're, we're scared of freedoms being taken away. We're scared of people turning against us. And we see society starting to turn against us. And I, I believe that's happening. It's been happening for a while. Christianity is not the top of the food chain in America. It's not been there for a while now. And we're on our way down in terms of how society sees us sees us more and more as the enemy. And so Satan is going to bear his might against us. We're going to get isolated. We're going to be the others that people will fear and people will demonize and people will dehumanize. And when that happens, what do we need to remember? 
we always need to re- remember that we are in the majority because the Lord Almighty is with us. And I don't say that from a position of arrogance or a position of they'll get theirs. I want us to remember that when that happens, like it happened to the, the people of Israel, hopefully they remember God is still with us even as the society was turning against us. We are still in the majority. This God King can't stand a lick against my king. Well, okay, but things go bad to worse. So we go into verse 11 here, because now we're into stage two, right? The formerly free people of Israel, they're rounded up, they're taken out of their homes, they're put into labor camps, and they're told they now have to build two cities from scratch. I've never built a city before, but I'm guessing it takes a little bit longer than an Amish barn raising on an afternoon. It's a big effort. Just think about that. Think about if, if your family was evicted from your house and they cart you off in trucks and they bring you in the middle of nowhere and you put a hat, hatchet in your hand and a saw in your other hand. It says, build us a city. How would you, you just go, like, how long will that take? Probably your life and your kids' lives and their kids' lives. Get, get on it. Go, start. But what's interesting here is this, this is, this is the, first part, or the second part of Pharaoh's shrewd plan. He's being as shrewd and, and crafty as he possibly can. And what's funny about this, darkly funny, is that the, as shrewd as he's being, God just turns the tables on him right away. Because what Pharaoh wants to do, why he's doing this, is not just to get a couple of free cities out of some cheap labor. He wants to crush them. He wants to grind them into nothingness. He figures he can work them literally to death. And then at the end of the day, he gets two cities. This people group is gone. He comes out win-win. But as he's doing that, as his plan is to break and shatter them, God looks down from heaven, arches his eyebrows, and says, if you think that these people reproduce like bunnies before, watch what happens now. Adversity is interesting. Suddenly there's a baby boom in the labor camps. The kids are popping out left and right. And it's, uh, it's crazy. Adversity has a funny way of bringing us together. It does. We can be living the good life and go, I don't need you. I, I've got every, all my comforts right here. But once we start going through hardship, we really start bonding with people. The military knows this. That's why they bring in complete strangers on buses every month or every other month to boot camps. These kids don't know each other. They've never, they're, they're not, they don't care about each other. But suddenly put them through hard training where every day is hardship and sweat and toil and it's not the most fun summer camp they've ever been to in their life. And at the end of it, they're a unit. They're bonded. They're brothers and sisters and they're together together. Send them off to war where they bleed and they suffer, they will bond even more. Adversity is a crucible and it binds people together. And God knew this. Remember last week we talked about these three great promises that God made Adam, or that he was going to bring them a savior, a Messiah. Abraham, I'm going to give you a land, I'm going to give you a people. And then to Jacob, I'm going to get, bring you to Egypt and I'm going to forge you into a great nation, and I'll bring you out. Well, now we're in the forging process. God ordained the slavery of His people so that they would bond together. That forging wasn't happening when they were off in Goshen, and they were enjoying really good food and a couple rounds of golf on the weekend. Right? They weren't coming together as a people. They they were probably in danger of just assimilating into Egyptian culture forever. But God isolated them. God brought them together. God gave them an identity. And He gave them a whole lot of babies. And we see this, you know, babies bring people together, right? Family brings people together. Hardship brings people together. And suddenly, they look at the Egyptians and go, we're not them. We're God's people. We're the Hebrews. We've got our people together. And I've gone through a hard thing. You've gone through a hard thing. We're bonded. We're together. This isn't God scrambling, by the way, to make lemonade out of lemons. To go, oh, wow, what happened down there? I better get on this. 
I better work through this. Psalm 105, verse 25 tells us, at this exact moment in history, quote, God turned the hearts of the Egyptians to hate his people, to deal craftily with his servants. On one level it is Satan, but above that is God. And God planned this to happen. This is God's plan. Because of eventual, instead of letting them fall apart and becoming nothing, God set them apart in a visible way and gives them a distinct national identity. And this is crucial. But make no mistake, I'm not saying, wow, this was great times for them all. They suffered. They suffered greatly. The text is telling you one of the interesting things about Exodus, by the way, the author likes to say things in sevens. And one of these verses, if you went like, wow, he's saying the word work a lot. He's saying like the same word seven times, the same concept seven times. To really drill into your head, this was no picnic. They were suffering under the overseer's lash, under hot suns, toiling for years upon years until their bodies fell apart and they died. This was not good times. But why did they have to go through this? Well, the harder the Israelites worked, the more they survived, and the worse off they seemed to be for it. And this, too, is part of God's plan. That the Israelites had, at this moment of history, to be primed for the exodus. They had to be ready to leave. If you make your house a little too comfortable and your son or daughter turns 18, it's going to be really hard to root them out of there. You come up to them and say, well, now you got to start paying rent, kid. Whoa, look at the time. I'm going to go find my own apartment, pops. You know, it's like they're out of there, right? This is God. He's priming his people. He doesn't want them to get comfortable in Egypt like they were. He wants them to start getting ready to get out of there, to go, to go to the land they had been promised. And God knew that in this moment, by ordaining their suffering, they would, for the very first time in their lives, start looking for a Savior. Start crying out to God, God, save us. Only when you know that you're in the pit, only when you see your depravity and your sin and what that brings about, only when you're suffering, only when you're at your final straw, do you go, Lord, I can't do anything more. I need you. And this is what God is doing through this process. Centuries later, the Apostle Paul, by the way, Paul suffered greatly as well. He was very acutely aware of what suffering does in your life. He said, this is how God forges all of us. He says, we rejoice in our sufferings, knowing that suffering produces endurance. And endurance produces character, and character produces what is that hope for? For a Savior. For somebody to come into your life in the midst of your suffering and save you and redeem you and take you to a place you couldn't have even imagined. So that at that point, you glorify God and you praise His name and you say, thank you for taking me out of that. God will use any technique, any tool at His disposal to set you apart for Him. Some of us are set apart in a very cushy environment. Some of us are set apart in very hard situations. And in all of these cases, our God who is sovereign above all things is setting us apart for Him and priming us for the life. And when this happens, when we're going through hard times, I want you to do something for me. Look around, because you're going to see you're not alone. That there will be other Christians, brothers and sisters, being forged alongside of you. And you're going to start developing a bond with them. Look at the countries like China and Egypt right now in today's society that are under fierce persecution of the Christians. Those Christians and those, not only do they believe in God more fervently than you can possibly imagine, but they are tight with each other. They are there for each other. They put their lives on the line for the gospel. This is what God can do for us. Several years ago, um, Jeremiah, I think it was around seven, Ellie was six. It was a Saturday afternoon, and I thought, well, I'm sitting there on the couch, and I got my iPad. I go, Kids, come over. I want, to, I want to show you a movie. I want to show you this movie about Egypt. It's called uh, The Prince of Egypt. It's about the Exodus. I thought it would be a good time. So I sit them down. And this was back when I could have one on one lap, one on the other lap without them cutting off my circulation in my legs. 
And they curled up to me, and we got, got the movie out. We're watching the movie, and it's all, you know, the, oh, if you've never seen this movie, I love it. The opening song is called Deliver Us. It's a great, like, summary of the first few chapters of Exodus. It really gets you in the mood and shows you the hardship of what they're going through and everything. So we're watching this. By minute three, my kids are in tears. They are bawling. I, Jeremiah, maybe a little more than Ellie. I don't know, but they were like tears and, you know, and I'm, I'm putting on pause. Joy comes in the room like, what are you doing to my kids? What did you show them? I'm like, a movie about the Bible? I, you know, so what had happened? Because once they started stopped crying, I asked them, like, what's, what's going on? And they told me, they're like, what they had clocked in, in this opening part is that most of this isn't, isn't narrated. They're not really telling you what's going on. They're just showing you. And there's a part where the soldiers are running from house to house looking for the kids. We're not quite there yet in Exodus, but it happens. And the soldiers go from house to house, and you hear the screams of the moms. And my kids, suddenly, it clicked in their head, they're killing the babies. And they cried because they knew how precious those kids were. And they saw the, the evil vileness of what the world could bring against children. And they hated it. I hate it too. And we need to, to hate it. In the weeks ahead of us, when we will go into hard passages, when we'll look at the plagues, and especially the last plague, and we will wrestle with why God does this to the Egyptians, I want you to remember what this king and his country are doing to God's people. I want you to remember these verses. Because we will want to recall how the whole country turned against the Hebrews. How they beat them. How they enslaved them. How they made them others. And how eventually they started murdering their children. Initially, Pharaoh decides he's going to do it through the Hebrews themselves. And so what Egypt liked to do, what the Pharaoh would always do, is he had overseers for every single part of society. So, I mean, that was how they delegated. So one or two people was over, you know, commerce and trade and even down to, like, little things like, you know, like religion, all, the, all these different parts of society. So, of course, there were overseers that he had over the, the Egyptian midwives and over the Hebrew midwives. And so he calls in the two overseers, Shifra and Pua, and I know we can look at those names and go, that's, that's weird, have those moments like, ha, ha, it's a little funny name. But these two women are called in and they're told by the, by the Pharaoh, by the God King, by the man who has their lives in the palm of his hand, he says, when they give birth, I want you to check between their legs. If it's a girl, fine, let her live. If it's a boy, Girls, of course, could be married into Egyptian families. They could be assimilated. But the boys might grow up to become soldiers. They might grow up to get, have more children according to their family lineage. So the boys had to go. And it's at this moment that we get two of the most amazing heroines in all of the Old Testament. I used to say, I had a friend once who said, well, God always... Always is, you know, the Bible is always male centric. It's always the patriarchy. It's, it's always, they're always the guys who are the heroes. And I said, that's not really the truth. Look at so many stories in the Bible in ancient times where most ancient texts wouldn't even mention women, by the way. And our Bible elevates them to the position of hero again and again. And right here, I think we get two that we overlook because they're really just mentioned in like one or two verses and we move on. But look at what those one or two verses have. Because these two women decide in this moment when they're told by the God king of the country they're in to kill these babies, they go no. They don't say it to his face, but they decide they're not going to be a part of this massacre. There are times, the Bible tells us, that when vile kings order us to do vile things against God, it is not just our right, but it is our duty to perform civil disobedience. We have to be very careful about what those moments are. 
It's not just, hey, April 15th rolled around, I don't want to pay my taxes. Civil disobedience! You know, God, no. The Bible tells us to pay our taxes as much as we don't like that. But we remember in Acts 5 when Peter was out there and he's preaching and the, 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 the uh, Israelite leaders are like, beat him up and said, well, go out there, but don't talk about Jesus anymore. And Peter says, no, we will because we fear God more than we fear man. And this is, a, this is something we see pop up in the Bible. We saw it with Rahab. We're seeing it with these two midwives. They decide at this moment, what they are being commanded to do is a vile sin. And they feared God more than they feared Pharaoh. And so they decide they're not going to do it even if they die. Even if they're executed for this in this moment. They're going to be protectors of the innocents. And I want you to take a pause in a moment of realizing, just put yourself in their shoes and go, they had every excuse in the book to say, we were just following orders. Don't blame us, blame that guy. But they didn't, did they? They had the power to do something about this horrible action, and they took it. And Shifra and Pua, they started a pro-life revolution that swept through the country. It's a really cool to see. All of the midwives, now they, they instruct all of the midwives, they're like, forget what that guy said, you give these kids a fighting chance to live. And so the babies keep coming, there's this tidal wave of babies. It's a theme here. And, and then they're called in. Pharaoh calls them in. He's like, look at the census chart. The Hebrews keep going up and up and up. There's baby boys all over the place. Pharaoh goes, what gives? Right? And their answer to Pharaoh is actually kind of ingenious, a little bit hilarious, because they go, well, they're so vigorous. Remember how you said that they were vigorous? They're so vigorous that these babies just pop out of them faster than we can get to their houses. We get the call, we shuffle over there, and there's a baby boy, and oh, well, he's born, what can we do? Right? Uh, and, and Pharaoh kind of believes that, right? Because yeah, that's what he believes about the, the Hebrews. They're so fertile and so virile that they're, they're popping out. Now, some people struggle with this passage uh, because they go, well, they lied, right? This is a lie. Uh, there's a few different ways you can interpret this. Do we have a command to, to tell the truth to evil? Some Christians would go, no. That there are times, as much as God instructs us to tell the truth, that we do not have to tell the truth to evil. World War II, you're hiding the Jews in your floorboards. Jews come al- the Gestapo comes along and says, are you hiding the Jews? Is it morally right to say, yeah, no, we're not hiding anybody. Another way you could interpret this text is say they kind of told him the truth. Like maybe they just, maybe this is actually what happened. Maybe they did just go instruct the midwives and go, drag your feet. You get the call, you just go, well, I'm going to take my siesta and I, I might be there in the house in a couple hours. And all of the babies there, I can't do anything about it. Maybe God did make these babies come super, super fast. We don't know. But we do know these women were honored by God. So God obviously was not frowning upon them for this moment in their life. And there are two ways as we look at this descent into outright murder and oppression of God's people. There are two ways you can view this passage. You can look at it through the lens of Satan. You can see how Satan uses his power, and it's not inconsiderable. He has power and influence over the Pharaoh. And he works through this king's life to bring fear-mongering and slavery and murder in an attempt to crush the people of God. God loves these people, I'm going to kill them. That's Satan's MO. You can see in this passage, without just skimming over it, whitewashing it, this was horrible, this was terrible for the people involved. There was death, there was suffering, there was a loss of freedoms. And you can see it from Satan's perspective that yes, he's hurting God's people. But we can also look at it from God's. And you can just see it again and again in this passage. That's not like a whole bunch of bad stuff happened, where's God? It's bad stuff happened, God's there. Bad stuff happened, God's there. Bad stuff, God's there. And God keeps repeatedly taking these defeats and these punishments and these attempts on behalf of the king, and he keeps plucking victory after victory after victory. Pharaoh wants to crush them, more babies come. Pharaoh wants to kill the babies, more babies come. He's going to drown the country in babies 
That would be really funny, but that's, uh, that's kind of what, what's happening. And we see this in the last couple of verses we read right here, before the very last verse of chapter 1, which we'll go into next week. But in these final few verses, we see God looking at Pharaoh, and his hand just kind of goes over that baby-making dial and twists it all the way over. Like, he's blessing, he blesses the midwives with families of their own. And he says, look at this. Look at how I am accomplishing the promise that I made to Abraham. They're on their way to start outnumbering the stars, aren't they? When the, end, when the evil of the world looks so immense and so overwhelming to us, when we watch the evening news and we fret and we frown and we think everything's going to collapse tomorrow, we need to pray to have the perspective to see the world the way God does. We need to have eyes for God. God, open my eyes that I may see what you are doing in the world and what you are doing in this situation. Help me to trust you. Because if the Israelites could just see what God was doing in their lives to forge them into a nation, to give them children, and to prepare them to get out of Egypt, they would have blessed God and praised God even as they sweat and screamed and bled. We sometimes even need to feel bad for puny little God kings that try to stand up to God driving his seven-story steamroller and going, I'm not going to let you do this. And God just steps on the gas and goes right over him. There's no way this guy can stand up to God, but Satan's going to try. And we're going to see more of how he's going to try that in the weeks to come. But right now, just know when you are falling out of favor with the world, when you have that fall from favor, Usually, you are falling into the favor of Jesus Christ. And there is no better place to be. So rest secure in that, no matter what's going on. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for these words from Exodus. Help bring in our our hearts the excitement and anticipation for the coming deliverance of Israel to remind us of our own deliverance from sin. So many parallels, Lord. But right now, also help us not to become fearful as the world is fearful, but to know we can be bold for you. That in the end, you are victorious no matter what. You will work through your people. We are redeemed no matter what. We cannot be taken out of your hands. That you will use our lives for something meaningful that will last throughout all of eternity. Lord, for all of that, we just say thank you. We are privileged. We are honored. We are not worthy, but we are yours. In your name, amen. In Deuteronomy 8, Moses writes, Beware, lest you say in your heart, My power and the might of my hand has gotten me this wealth. You shall remember that the Lord your God, for it is He who gives you your wealth, that He may confirm His covenant that He swore to your fathers as it is this day. Everything we have is from the hand of God. We offer this time of tithes and offerings that you may give back a portion to God for his use.
goodness, I lose my doubt and fear. The far the path he leadeth, but one step I may see. His eye is on the sparrow, and I know he watches me. His eye is on the sparrow, and I know he watches me. Let's rise and sing our doxology together. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him all creatures here below. Praise Him above ye heavenly hosts. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Amen. Lord, we give to you our tithes and offerings given from your hand back to you for your use in this world. Please bless it in your name. Amen.
you would like to have an elder pray over you after the service, we are here in front. Come talk to us. But for now, receive the benediction from the book of Ephesians. Now to him who is able to do far more abundantly than all we ask, all we think, according to the power at work within us, to him be the glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. Amen. Go in peace, go in grace.